Good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle Galazuski. I'm a Partner Relations Director with Eversight. And on behalf of everyone at Eversight, I would like to thank you for joining the third program of our webinar series, Keratoprothesis Prothesis in Corneal Blindness. Before we get started with tonight's program, I would like to make everyone aware of two additional webinars that we will be adding to our series. On Thursday, May 28th, we will cover the topic of reopening your practice with an effective communication plan. And on Wednesday, June 3rd, we will cover the impact of COVID-19 on ocular disease and donor tissue. Invitations to register for these two events will be coming out on Friday. Please be sure to look for them and join us for these important and educational programs. In an effort to eliminate all background noise this evening, all participants will be muted throughout the duration of the webinar. If you would like to ask a question, you may do so by typing it into your Q&A panel on your screen. We will address all questions at the conclusion of the presentation. At this time, I would like to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Soledad Cortina. Dr. Cortina is the Director of the Comprehensive Ophthalmology Faculty Practice General Eye Clinic and Keratoprothesis Artificial Cornea Program at UI Health. Dr. Cortina has clinical interests in corneal transplantation, refractive surgery, cataracts, and anterior segment disease. Dr. Cortina joined the Illinois Eye and Ear Infirmary as a board certified ophthalmologist and cornea specialist in 2010. Recognized internationally for her research in corneal surgery and keratoprosthesis, she has presented at meetings and symposia around the world and has numerous publications in peer-reviewed journals. In addition, she has received the Best Doctors in America recognition annually since 2010. Dr. Cortina, you can start. Thank you so much for those kind words. I'm very happy to be here tonight. Uh, given this webinar, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank Eversight for their ongoing support, their, their fight against corneal blindness, their support through these difficult times, uh, and their every attempt to meet the surgeon's needs. Uh, they certainly have met mine during COVID and beyond, so I, I wanted to thank them for having me here tonight. And today we're going to talk about keratoprosthesis and what the role is in corneal blindness. Uh, we're going to focus mostly on um, the art artificial cornea that we call the Boston type 1 keratoprosthesis, which is the most commonly used artificial cornea around the world. And then we're, if we have time, we're going to go over uh, a few other devices that are uh, less used, but that also play a role in the fight against corneal blindness. So let's talk a little bit about the scope of the problem. We know, sorry, we know that um, there are approximately 4.9 million people that are bilaterally blind solely from corneal disease in the world. And this means that their best corrected vision is less than 2,400. Unfortunately, these include over 1 million children. And as much as we've tried, penetrating keratoplasty only has had a modest impact in corneal blindness, mostly because there's not that many transplants performed around the world when we compare with what the need is. And, and also because most of these transplants are performed in the uh, developed world um, and we need to do better in the developing world. And, um, and those countries, many of those patients actually uh, don't have access to corneal transplantation. Um, so we do need an artificial cornea because there may still be shortage of donor corneas, not in the United States and some other uh, countries that are doing very well, but in many, uh, in many countries around the world where the eye banking system is still in developing um, stages and, and they can't really provide their surgeons uh, with adequate tissue for, for surgery. Uh, there, there's sometimes a problem with uh, donors that, that for cultural, religious re regions, sometimes maybe financial reasons. Um, so it is estimated that about 50% of the world's population has no access to corneal transplantation. 
And also there's still a high failure rate for keratoplasty worldwide. So it always depends on the indication for keratoplasty. And while some do very well, there are others that have a poor prognosis. So if we look at the survival rate, this is from the Australian registry for low risk grafts, we, we think, okay, we have a great technique for those patients that are low risk. We have, you know, over 80% over 80%, um, over 80 survival rate at five years and over 50% at 10 years. So the, the, these are good outcomes. But if we switch it up and look at those patients that required one regraft, they've had one graft failure, the, the curve significantly drops. And if we look at those that had more, needed required more than one regraft, then it almost reaches zero. So the survival rate in those high risk patients, meaning those with autoimmune disease, corneal vascularization, limbal stem cell deficiency, chemical injury, even glaucoma, all of those patients, their survival rate at five years goes from zero to 25%. So the alternative to a penetrating keratoplasty was um, uh, brought to us by Dr. Dolman, uh, and it's called the Boston Type 1 Keratoprosthesis. This is the most commonly used artificial cornea in the world. It, we've been using it in the United States since 1992 when it was cleared by the FDA. Um, and again, it's indicated for those patients where you know the, the traditional penetrating keratoplasty will not work in the long run. So a few decades ago, the, the use of artificial corneas was limited. It was really the, the, the last resort. It was, wasn't offered in almost any centers uh, because the rates of endophthalmitis was high and the rates of corneal melt were also high. But during this past decade, um, there's been improved in the design of the device. Uh, there's been a reduction in the incidence of these postoperative complications. And it has, we have seen it a much better acceptance among cornea surgeons, where now it's almost becoming the treatment of choice for those patients that have poor prognosis for PKP. Uh, we know that implanting an artificial cornea can just like a, a transplant, a regular transplant can significantly impact a patient's quality of life. Um, a, a, a keratoprosthesis also, and we studied this actually in our service, and we saw that um, not just improves the vision-related quality of life, uh, this is independently of what their gain in vision is, of, of their actual visual acuity. And it also showed that even when the contralateral eye sees better than 2200, their, their vision-related quality of life still improves when they're implanted with a keratoprosthesis in their worst seeing eye. So the device consists of a, a color button design. It has a PMMA optic um, that you can see right here. Uh, there's a fresh graft as a carrier. So you still need uh, tissue to perform this procedure. And uh, I would say 99% of the time, the tissue will come from your eye bank. Um, uh, in certain uh, areas in the world where the tissue is really scarce and the patient's cornea um, is adequate, has adequate thickness, et cetera, then it could, the, we could do an autograft and use the uh, patient's own cornea. Um, there are other, um, there are some studies that have looked at using cryopreserved corneas for this procedure with, with acceptable results as well. Um, so the back plate um, can be made of titanium or PMMA. So you can see here you have the optic, the back plate, and um, a locking ring that secures everything into place. And it, uh, the, um, the graft will be sandwiched in between those two, th those two portions of the keratoprosthesis, like you see it over, over here already assembled. Uh, so you, you have the back plate, the optic is on the other side, this is the optical stem, and this, this is the older model with the titanium locking ring, and you see the graft is right in the middle. So who is truly a candidate for keratoprosthesis? <clears throat> well, the most important thing as when we are doing any type of surgery is that you, you have the indication right, that it's the right indication. This will determine the success. Well, these couldn't be more true in, in K-PRO. Um, so those patients that have repeat corneal graft failure. So 
Um, we all have records about how many grafts we've done in a patient. I remember when I was a fellow, um, there was a patient that had had 11 transplants in one eye. Um, and I think I did that 11th. So at some point, you know, every subsequent graft will have even worse prognosis. So at some point you need to decide um, that is not indicated anymore. Uh, those patients with um, <clears throat> limbal stem cell failure um, and any vascularized cornea, you know, more than three quadrants where you know that they have a poor prognosis for penetrating keratoplasty and even neurotrophic corneas like HCO or HSV. We learned from prior studies that there are prognostic categories. So not every patient that gets implanted with an artificial cornea will do the same. And those patients that do really well are those non-inflammatory underlying conditions like graft failures, dystrophy, trauma, maybe they had keratoconus, they've had five grafts with rejection and now you're moving to an artificial cornea. Or maybe they had lattice dystrophy and now you're moving to an artificial cornea. So those patients that have had multiple graft failures for conditions that are non-inflammatory. Intermediate prognosis are those patients with aniridia, just because aniridia in itself is a diagnosis that's more guarded because it's a syndrome and it involves other parts of the eye, they get glaucoma, uh, they get fibrosis. So that, that's why they, they tend to have a, a, a worse prognosis or intermediate prognosis, those with chemical burns, those with um, neurotrophic keratitis like HSV and HCO, and those uh, uh, with a history of, of, of infections. And the worst category are those uh, with autoimmune diseases like Steven Johnson's and ocular cicatricial pemphigoid, um, severe atopic disease. So these patients with severe ocular surface disease, they have the worst prognosis for any procedure that you do and, and K-Pro is no different. So when you're thinking about implanting an artificial cornea, when I'm looking at a patient and I'm thinking, okay, is this patient a good candidate? There's basically three features that I'm looking. And I'm thinking, okay, is the ocular surface moist? It doesn't have, they don't have to have a shermers of 25, but is, is it moist or, or is this bone dry and keratinized? Do they have good fornices or do they have symblepharon? Because we're gonna have to accommodate a bandage contact lens later on. And do they have controlled ocular surface inflammation? So if these three are checks, then the patient is probably a good candidate for an artificial cornea. And I would add, you know, sometimes with a opacified cornea, um, it is difficult to estimate what the visual potential is. It's difficult to know whether, you know, the patient has had glaucoma and now the nerve uh, has been severely damaged or they have retinal disease. So as much as you can possibly study the eye, you know, with, with imaging and ultrasound and try to figure out what their potential is. Um, but I think in terms of your physical exam, these three key points are what's most important to decide whether the environment will be um, favorable for an implantation. So the worst case in your practice is not a good candidate for artificial cornea. Um, and this was supposed to play in sequence, I apologize, but there's sort of different patients. So the, the, that one with a multiple fail graph that looks like this, this is probably your best candidate. Somebody that looks like this, you can't really tell what's eyelid and what's cornea, it's definitely a no. This patient here with very abnormal eyelids, also I would say probably borderline to no. This patient here with aniridia, it's actually a good candidate. You know that this cornea will not clear with a limbal transplantation alone. And, and so then probably an artificial cornea makes sense. And this patient over here is again, a severe chemical injury. He did actually did well with a keratoprosthesis, but I would consider this patient pretty high risk. And I would say um, not the first patient that you do in your practice. So this is, a, uh, this is a video, this patient has um, 10 uh, or severe Steven Johnson's. It's a young 30-year-old uh, um, that we did an artificial cornea for. And the artificial cornea is, uh, is not compatible with a crystalline lens. So we, when we implant it, we're gonna uh, typically do a triple procedure and we're going to remove the crystalline lens. 
Uh, it tends to be a bloodier surgery than your typical PK, just because most of these patients have a lot of, um, a lot of vessels uh, in their corneas. But essentially, we're going to remove the crystalline lens. We're going to clean up as much as possible. And then I tend not to implant any artificial lens. I put the power comes in the artificial cornea uh, and um, already in the optic. And then we're going to implant here um, an artificial cornea with a titanium backplate uh, that's seven millimeters. You can tell this is a patient that's high risk. This, again, is not the patient that you're gonna start with, you see how thin the host cornea is. And I already know he's gonna have difficulty epithelializing afterwards. So I'm gonna help him a little bit with amniotic membrane at the end of the surgery and a lateral tersorophy. Um, but essentially, you know, the surgery itself is not difficult. If you're used to doing a, a penetrating keratoplasty, it's even easier because you don't have to worry that much about astigmatism with your sutures tight sutures are okay, you'll remove it later on and, the, and uh, it's, not gonna cast an, it's not gonna cause any visual distortion to the patient. We're gonna put the contact lens that comes with the artificial cornea and then the surgery, it's over. So the post-op care of these patients, we, it's very important, like we said, I said before, um, because the cornea doesn't, uh, fully integrate with the PMMA of the optic, there's always the potential uh, path for uh, the ocular flora to enter the eye um, through, through, the, through the area between the, the, the stem and the, the corneal tissue. So these patients have a, a higher risk of uh, infections, particularly of endophthalmitis, and we figure out that the the culprit of these infections mostly are, is the ocular flora, so gram positives, and that's why with the introduction of topical vancomycin uh, as a prophylactic agent, the incidence of infections decreased significantly. Um, so we use, vanco I in my practice use vancomycin, 15 milligrams per cc for high risk patients, or uh, for lower risk patients, I'll use a fourth generation for a quinolone. For low risk patients, I may use polytrim, and I do betadine 5% at every visit when they come. I remove the contact lens and I put a drop of betadine. For infl inflammation control, we use prednisolone acetate. Initially, just at the normal regimen that you would use for a for a PKP and then it's tapered down. And they do not require systemic immunosuppression, like if you were doing a carolimbo allograft, for example. So this is one of the um, advantages of the artificial cornea. The bandage contact lens that is typically used is the contour lens uh, that comes in the packaging with the artificial cornea. Um, but you can modify the fit as necessary and change to different types of contact lenses. And we've used any form and shape of contact lens, and they all work for the right patient. For example, this patient, she wasn't so happy with the cosmesis of the artificial cornea, so we fitted her with a tinted lens and she was much happier. So what are the complications? Well, the most feared one is not the most common. I would say this is now a, a more of a rare complication, but it's still the most feared be because it can cause loss of the eye. And like I said, it's mostly due to gram-positive organisms. And there's many risk factors, right? They're wearing a contact lens continuously. They're using steroids. They have an, a compromised ocular surface. Many of these patients, uh, and all of these can put them at risk uh, for infection. And then this is just the graph from the paper from the Dolman group showing um, how the introduction of topical vancomycin significantly decreased the cases of endophthalmitis in these patients and why antibiotic prophylaxis is key. In fact, the highest risk factor for infection is lack of compliance with the regimen. Another complication can be thinning, melting, and extrusion of the device. Like you see right here, I'm sorry. You see right here, the cornea has melted and now the back plate is right there. And these keratoprosthesis is extruding. You can see the back plate right here. Um, 
It has significantly decreased the incidence since the device was modified and these back plates were introduced, these holes were introduced in the back plate, allowing for the cornea, the donor cornea to get nutrition from the aqueous humor. It also helps to use the bandage contact lens because it's decreased delan formation and improves hydration of the tissue. So today really it's not a huge problem. The retention rate long for most serious at five and ten years are around 80 to 95 percent. Some of the risk factors for, for this complication will be a dense retroprostatic membrane and we'll talk a little bit about that, this fibrous encapsulation of the device in the back of the artificial cornea, surface inflammation of course, persistent epithelial defects, contact lens loss and eyelid abnormalities. So kind of common sense things that could could get you into corneal epithelial trouble or can cause a melt. Retroprosthetic membranes, this is a particular interest of mine, uh, and, and it's basically a membrane that's growing behind the artificial cornea, and you can see here how it's filling up the holes in, the, in this back plate. Um, it's the most common compl complication, and it can occur between 25 and 65 percent of patients. And it, it can obstruct the visual access. Luckily, most of the time, when it's not too thick, we can laser this, just like we laser a posterior capsular opacity, and patients do pretty well. Uh, but it, it not just affects the vision, it can lead to secondary complications, like for example, uh, keratolysis, like we talked before, because it, now it's blocking the nutrition into the corneal graft. Um, and some of the patients that have very thick membranes might require a pars plana membranectomy and sometimes even a capro replacement. If you look at the anterior segment OCT, um, then you can characterize the parts of the capro. So this is your front plate with the stem. This is the back plate. This shadow here is caused by the titanium locking ring right here. This is where the, um, the optical stem ends. And this is the donor cornea. This is the contact lens. And you can see right here, this tissue right behind the capro that makes this uh, specific shape, sorry, this specific shape like this and then stops abruptly because of the shadow from the locking ring. This is the retroprosthetic membrane. And it can grow quite thick. In this case, it's almost 300 microns. So, you know, not quite like a cornea, but almost, and some of them can grow even thicker. So this is a study we did in our service, and we looked at the risk of corneal melt in those patients that had retroprosthetic membranes and those that didn't. And what we found was that the risk ratio of developing a subsequent melt in patients that have retroprosthetic membranes behind the back plate was 2.9, compared to eyes that had no evidence of retroprosthetic membranes. Glaucoma is also one of the most um, common complications after keratoprosthesis. And I would say that glaucoma is a common complication for any form of keratoplasty, particularly more for penetrating keratoplasty, and then even more so for artificial corneas. It's the leading cause of permanent vision loss in these patients, and the incidence is pretty high. Now, it's not that 84 of patients with keratoprosthesis developed glaucoma, you know, we have to think that the vast majority of these patients already have glaucoma before the keratoprosthesis is implanted. So in our practice, and I think this is a trend all around the world, we will place a valve um, to regulate the pressure at the time of the artificial cornea. So the video is showing our quote unquote triple procedure where we'll Put an, uh, we'll tree find the cornea and we'll put a temporary keratoprosthesis. We will do a um, professionally performed pars plana vitrectomy by a vitro retinal specialist um, that will shave the vitreous uh, quite peripherally so that then we can place a shunt in the pars plana. And I like to place the shunt in the pars plana to avoid uh, the crowding of the hardware in the anterior chamber and to avoid the shunt later on being uh, obstructed um, by fibrous tissue. So here in the video, you can see the shaving of the vitreous. We've already placed the bare belt um, plate uh, sutured into place. Now we can um, place the shunt into the eye uh, 
and then we we make sure that it's in the right position uh it's in the parspana where we want it and then we'll go ahead and implant the artificial cornea just like we normally would and here you can see us checking making sure the spot is that correct one that it went all the way through um so the mechanism for glaucoma after artificial cornea can be multifactorial. Uh, you know, it's difficult to check the pressure afterwards because now the front is plastic and so aplanation doesn't work and we have to resort to finger palpation and that's never very accurate. Um, but we can image these patients, we can image their optic nerve and we can do visual fields and these helps us follow them over time. And so I would say that this is something that always has to be in your mind. And I would recommend, unless they have hypotony or, or, or pressures on the lower side without any you know, uh, history of glaucoma, I would highly recommend that you, play, that you place a valve if they don't have a functioning one at the time of the artificial cornea. And here we're finishing up the case, just gonna close the conjunctiva. So this was published also by our group uh, about the triple procedure. And the other advantage of placing the shunt in the pars plana is now you have, a, you're feeding them with a large contact lens. So you could see before the contour is about 16 millimeters. And sometimes we fit them even with larger lenses. And then it's a very nice flat profile uh, for the shunt and fits very nicely. And you can see it here in the OCT also, the shunt going into the pars plana. So shunts can have complications, and we've noticed that most of the complications of exposure happened in those shunts that we did not place in the pars plana. So always think about the GDI position. This is a patient that had the shunt in the anterior, in the sulcus. This is a patient, oh, I'm sorry, that had the shunt, the, the shunt in the anterior chamber. And look at the difference, this patient, from the photo before, it's wearing a 16 millimeter contour lens very nicely and no risk of exposure. And this patient's wearing a 24 millimeter contour lens, nice bleb, again, no risk of exposure with the shunt in the pars plana. What are the long-term outcomes of these patients? Um, so this is a study published from the UCLA group and shows pretty good results, at least you know, in terms of retention uh, long-term. Uh, with over 60% um, to 80% of patients retaining uh, the keratoprosthesis at five and seven years. Um, so if you compare this retention with the, how they, the patients with uh, one failed graft fare, then you can see that at least this favors artificial cornea. Uh, this is another uh, paper coming from Iowa uh, that's looking at visual outcomes. And you can see this is the vision uh, preoperatively and this is vision postoperatively and even at six months, uh, it's statistically significant improved vision in most patients. So in summary, the Boston type 1 keratoprosthesis, I think now it's the standard of care for patients with poor prognosis for penetrating keratoplasty. Outcomes including long-term retention and visual acuity are quite good. Postoperative complications are frequent and may cause permanent vision loss. So careful patient selection and close post-op management are key to a successful outcome. Um, so I said we were gonna talk a little bit about other keratoprosthesis. So we said the Boston type one keratoprosthesis, we needed three things. And one was a wet ocular surface. Um, and we can do it either for those patients that have had failed grafts, but we can also do it for patients that have not had a, a failed graft, but their cornea, because of its characteristics, we know they're poor candidates for a penetrating keratoplasty. But for those patients with extreme dry eye conditions, we have to look for other options. The Boston type 2 keratoprosthesis is um, this one that you're seeing right here in the middle. So essentially, the design is the same as a type 1, except the stem is a little bit longer, and um, it has an extra protrusion of the, stem, of the stem that you can close the eyelids over, and that gives extra protection to the, to the cornea. And then the osteodontal keratoprosthesis, where we 
um, the way it's done is we re removed uh, a canine tooth and then uh, that will be the future haptic of the prosthetic device. Um, the optic is still made of PMMA. It is done in two stages. Um, and very few centers around the world perform this procedure. There's some in Europe, some in Asia, none in the United States so far. Uh, but it does have a very good track record uh, with good long-term retention. Uh, complications can include glaucoma infection and laminar reabsorption from the, den from the tooth, the, the dentine lamina. But um, in general, their post-op care is a little bit less intensive than for the other keratoprosthesis. So for those patients that are kind of borderline, so you don't want to go to the extreme and do a type two, but, but, but they are not good candidates for a type one, like this patient with a very severe chemical burn, you're thinking, okay, what do I do? Do I have to go to a type two or a type one? So the first thing to do is to try a reconstruction. And we know that for my, myosin blepharon, we can just do amniotic membrane, but when the symblepharon is severe, we have to report to oral mucosa so that there's a source of epithelial cells uh, to cover the surface. So this is an example of a patient that later on went on to get a keratoprosthesis. She has ectodermal dysplasia and she had symblepharon and we reconstructed her with amniotic membrane and she did very well with that recurrence of the symblepharon and she's done very well with her artificial cornea. So um, it's important to assess how good the remaining conjunctiva is and once you know whether you have uh, a good source of epithelial cells from the residual conjunctiva, you can decide whether this patient needs to have just amniotic membrane or, 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 or needs uh, a buccal mucosal graft. So here we're just trimming the, um, the amniotic membrane and we typically use uh, fibrin glue for these cases. Uh, because it's less inflammatory, it's much easier and I think patients do a lot better with it. Uh, we'll put bolsters and, and fornix, um, fornix sutures to secure the membrane in place. And uh, we like to keep the symblepharon ring for a good amount of time, over a month if possible, sometimes more. But when patients don't have good residual conjunctiva, for example, like this patient or this patient, then we may have to reconstruct them with uh, buccal mucosa and we take it from the lip if possible. This is the patient from our initial photo that we're reconstructing with buccal mucosa and amniotic membrane and um, their post-op after the reconstruction you can see um, you can see the grafts here in upper and lower the symblepharon ring and 10 months post-op you can see that he's done quite well he's moist He's retained the furnaces, so we're gonna go ahead and do a keratoprosthesis. Uh, this patient had a very severe chemical injury, so you see the silk sutures here, they're from a retinal implant. He required um, uh, um, a scleral buckle to fix the uh, RD that was diagnosed prior to surgery when we were working him up uh, to implant the capro. So we're doing the vitrectomy here, we're gonna shave the vitreous, uh, we're going to place the shunt at the same time, and now we're placing the, uh, the artificial cornea. And now, interesting to see, we've reconstructed this patient from basically ankyloblepharum, but we still have this reconstructed conjunctiva to be able to cover the shunt. So while not everybody can get a shunt because of a lack of good conju uh, conjunctival tissue, in these patients, we were able to get away with it. And I think uh, if you can do a shunt as opposed to other forms of treatment for glaucoma like laser, I think it is preferable. Um, so we want to check on the shunt, make sure it looks good, and then we're gonna cover, cover, the, uh, cover the tube. Um, we use cryopreserved cornea. You can use the patient's own cornea as well to cover the, uh, the tube. We prefer that over sclera so that it's not as bulky and you can look at the tube at the slit lamp. So this is the final outcomes for three different patients um, that uh, got uh, ocular surface reconstruction and later on went to have a Boston type one keratoprosthesis and they all had uh, good outcomes with, you know, um, with uh, long-term retention of, retention of their artificial cornea.
Um, so, but when we can't do that, or we're unsuccessful doing um, doing a, a reconstruction, and we can't do a, a type one, then we may have to go to a type two K pro. I apologize. It looks like the video quality is not showing very good, at least in my screen. Maybe because it's uh, it's large, but basically, we're dissecting the eye. This patient's eye was completely, uh, you know, was ankylo blepharon. She wasn't. She wasn't able to be reconstructed. She has a uh, mucous membrane pemphigoid. Here we're putting an uh, AMET valve, and um, we're going to do again a triple procedure. So we're going to uh, refine the cornea first, um, and these cases, you know, it's recommended that you actually remove all of the conjunctiva if you can, so that then the eyelids will scar down and the eye won't move under, so that there's no torque. Um, it is also recommended that we remove the iris. This always makes me really nervous because sometimes it bleeds, uh, but basically we remove the, eye, uh, the iris completely. We clean up the eye, we'll take out the cataract, um, and then we'll do, uh, we'll do a first plan of vitrectomy. So again, quite bloody surgery, not the, uh, uh, what you're used to um, with other types of uh, transplants, but basically we'll take the cataract out, do a vitrectomy, we'll do a temporary keratoprosthesis just like we did before uh, for the other case. And basically the procedure is exactly the same um, with a vitrectomy. Let me see if I can um, advance the video a little bit. Um, now, see how it looks a little bit different, this artificial cornea, I want you to notice. Uh, it's the same as before, but it has an extra protrusion here that's going to allow for the eyelids to close over. So then we'll close the eyelids and immediately post-op, she'll look like this. And now she's about five years out from this surgery and she's doing quite well. So our experience is pretty limited with this procedure. It's also not very commonly done around the world, just a few centers. We've done seven in our, um, in, in our service, and some of them did well, some of them did not do so well. I think this is like a, a battle. Each eye is a battle. They always get complications, and it's a matter of how you handle them and how hard you fight. But, uh, you know, uh, some patients were able to, you know, gain vision for several years, and, and, and this, is, this is priceless. So the Lux keratoprosthesis is a new, newer model that uh, Boston is, has designed, and you can see the difference. So we're still going with that color button design, but you can see that now the back plate ha is titanium and has these petaloid shapes try to, to try to mimic the iris to improve cosmesis. And they've still done the PMMA optic, but they have put a sleeve of titanium to promote tissue adhesion to the keratoprosthesis. And it also has that a, long, a protrusion, just like the type two, um, but instead of putting the eyelids over, what it's placed is a buccal mucosal graft, like you would do for an osteodontal keratoprosthesis. And this is done for those patients that don't have good eyelids, or those patients that you'd rather not close the eyelids and use a buccal mucosal graft. Um, and then, the uh, modified osteodontal keratoprosthesis, which is probably the keratoprosthesis that we have the longest track record. And this is uh, from the study from Dr. Falginelli in Italy. And you can say he has this, I want to call your attention, it's not 18 months, it's years that he's followed this, this, um, these patients. And uh, he has a community probability of retention, you know, that's over 80% at 18 years. I think that's quite, Quite remarkable. Uh, they do get complications just like all artificial corneas do. Uh, but the visual outcomes are also good. But again, as we see with all of the other artificial corneas too, they do tend to decrease, you know, or, or see some attrition of visual acuity over time. And I think that's all I have for today. Um, uh, you know, I hope you enjoyed uh, learning about all the different devices that we have available and what their different indications might be. Um, and I can answer any questions if uh, anybody has any questions.
Dr. Cortina, we do have two questions. Uh, okay. for, first question is, I have seen some studies about the development of low-cost K-Pro, Lucia. Are there significant differences in design? Would you consider using the Lucia or are the indications of it meant for international in resource poor areas? Yeah, so the Lucia is not, is not available here in the United States. It, it, the, the idea is for, you know, again, with, with a goal of improving corneal blindness around the world is to have an artificial cornea that's affordable uh, for, for the developing countries. And the difference in the, with the Lucia is that it only has one axial length. So when you order your Boston type one keratho procedure or your Boston type two, you'll measure the axial length of the patient and then you'll, um, and then you'll order according to that axial length so that the power of the keratho prosthesis for the aphakic model will already be built into that uh, optic system. So the Lucia only comes for one standard axial length and the residual refractive error gets corrected with a contact lens. That's the main difference. It also uses a titanium, um, titanium backplate uh, and essentially is the, the exact same device. There's another device that's being uh, produced in, um, in India. Uh, it's the AuroK Pro, and the studies coming out of India show that the results are comparable with the Boston Type 1 keratoprosthesis. And basically, the, the, the design was given to them, to the Aura Lab by Dr. Dolman. So it has the same specifications, it's just manufactured differently. I think the PMMA is machined differently and it's not polished in the same areas and, and, and all of these things. Um, but, uh, and again, I think that's the main difference, but the design in itself is the same and I think the outcomes are very similar. Next question is from Dr. Ahmed Omar. Great presentation. For patients with chemical burn and conjunctivalization of the corneal surface, which do you think would be, have better outcomes, K-Pro or keratolimbal allograft followed by PK? So this is my approach. It doesn't mean like it's the correct approach, but I typically, um, you know, keratolimbal allografts don't have... A, also don't do very well and don't last very long. And in my mind, if to a, a keratolimba allograft, you have to add a penetrating keratoplasty, the, the prognosis, you know, even goes down. So when I look at a patient, I think, okay, if the cornea, if I think that the cornea may have, they have limbal stem cell deficiency, but if I do a keratolimba allograft, the cornea will clear um, and epithelialize with corneal cells, and that would be enough for vision. Then I do. I go. We go for the carolimbo allograft. But if the cornea already has scarring, stromal scarring, um, deep con uh, conjunctivalization, and the patient's going to require a penetrating keratoplasty, I feel most of those keratoplasties typically fail. So, although sometimes we may do the carolimbo allograft, most of those patients end up with a K-Pro later on. So it's not unreasonable to think to go for the K-Pro from the beginning, unless unless you feel that their surface is very unstable and they have recurrent epithelial defects. And then I would probably go for the carolimbo allograft first, even if I was thinking on a K-Pro later on, just so that this surface gets somewhat stabilized. All right. Next question is from Dr. Jennifer Park. Wonderful talk, Dr. Cortina. What is the minimum amount of time you wait between ocular surface reconstruction and K-PRO implantation? I think it all depends um, on, on the patient, but uh, I like to wait at least six months. Okay, and the last question from Dr. Ahmed Omar, and I apologize if I say some of these words wrong. If the patient is pseudophagic, would you consider explanting the IOL to use the aphakic K-PRO or would you use the pseudophagic model? That's a great question. Um, and it's something that we, we discuss and we, we debate a lot. Um, I personally like the aphakic K-PRO much better. I feel like a lot of the times the IOL gives me problems um, because um, the, the iris and the anterior capsule may get incorporated into a membrane and then the, uh, the position of the IOL shifts 
And then if you want to laser the membrane, it gets trapped in between the optic and the, and the IOL and you can't laser it uh, and the, the, it, it affects the patient's vision. So I don't love leaving the intraocular lens, but I will leave it in those patients that have a deep chamber and the lens is inside the bag, otherwise completely normal anterior segment, I will leave it. I don't leave any sulcus lenses, of course, don't leave any ACIOLs. Um, and, and if I have any questions about the lens, uh, then I will, I will remove it. So I know it's a, you have to commit, you have to make a decision before, right? So I, I, what, what I've done, uh, and I realize that this may not be possible in every center, is I, I have a pseudo-fake K-Pro in the OR that I don't let them return. And then for each patient, I will order the fake K-Pro. And then I will make the decision in, during the surgery which one I think will be best, and then I'll construct that one. But I understand that's sort of a luxury a big luxury and you do have to commit before. So I would say if they've had cataract surgery, uncomplicated, you know, intact capsular bag and normal anterior chamber, I would probably leave that IOL in place, but all the other IOLs are coming up. Okay, I don't have any additional questions at this time. So on behalf of Eversight, I would like to thank everyone again for joining us today. The webinar has has been recorded and will be available on our website to view on demand. As a reminder, we have an additional program next Wednesday evening on the topic of DALK. If you have not registered for that program, please do consider doing so. You'll be receiving a follow-up email shortly after the webinar concludes. It would be greatly appreciated if you would provide us with your feedback on today's session. A special thank you to Dr. Cortina for serving as today's speaker and for providing us with your invaluable expertise on this subject. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank everyone. you, Dr. Cortina. Thank you.